Hey guys, today we're going to look at what the cell membrane is made of and how it impacts cellular transport. So all membranes in the cell, whether we're talking about the outermost covering of the cell or the membranes inside the cell, like the nuclear membrane and the membrane of the ER and the Golgi, all of these membranes are going to have a really similar basic structure. And they're going to be made of a couple of the organic molecules that we learned about before. They're going to be made of proteins and lipids. So what does each one of these do? Well, first, the lipids are going to be responsible for isolating the cell or keeping it separate, almost like a fence around the outside. On the other hand, the proteins are going to be responsible for substances coming through. And we'll see how all of that's going to work in a minute. Now, we can also call the cell membrane a phospholipid bilayer. And here we've got an image that's going to show us the components of this bilayer. So first of all, with that prefix bi, what does that mean? Good, that's going to mean two layers. And here we can see one layer and a second layer. And both of those are made up of the phospho, whoa, lipids here and here. Now we said the other component was going to be proteins and we've got a number of them. We can see them here as almost like a channel. Here's another protein. Here's another protein. And actually, here's another one shown over here. So that's why we describe the membrane as being a phospholipid bilayer. And again, we've got some proteins embedded in there. We'll talk more about what they do in a minute. Let's think a little bit more about what this word phospholipid means. It tells us that there are going to be two parts to each of these layers. And the first part is going to be the head. And by the head, we mean sort of the round part. And that's going to be made up of what's called a phosphate group. That puts the phospho in phospholipids. Well, phosphate groups are what we call hydrophilic. And the hydro means water, and the philic means loving. So these phosphate heads love them some water. On the other hand, the tails are going to be pictured in this diagram as sort of these long stringy things. And while the heads were made of phosphate, the tails are made of fatty acids. And what do we know about fats? How do they feel about water? Good. Fats and water do not get along. Fats are lipids, and they are what we call hydro phobic. And if you have a phobia, you're afraid of things. So this literally means water scared. So what does that actually have to do with the arrangement of this phospholipid bilayer? Well, if we think about the cell, we know that inside the cell is really watery. And we also know that outside of the cell is really watery. So we need the heads that are water loving to aim themselves towards where the water's at, both outside and inside the cell. And if the tails are water scared, they're going to hide out together away from where the water's at. So these scaredy tails are hiding out and the heads are interacting just fine with the water outside and inside. If the whole goal of this membrane, its whole function, is to separate the cell from its environment to keep the contents in and the outsides out, we can also describe the membrane as selectively permeable. And that term selective means it's picky. And permeable tells us it's picky about who comes in and who leaves. Only certain materials get to pass through a selectively permeable membrane. And it's a good thing that our cells are picky. We don't just want any old substance wandering in or out. 
before we really dive into things moving into and out of the cell, we need a couple more background words that have to do with solutions. And the first background word is solute. And the solute refers to the substance that's being dissolved. So in a solution, one substance is being dissolved, and I'm thinking about maybe crystal light or Kool-Aid or a protein mix. Anytime we take like a powder and dissolve it in water, the powder part is what's being dissolved. So that would be the solute of the solution. On the other hand, there's also the solvent, and the solvent is what's doing the dissolving. So this is going to be the liquid portion. So in our examples of crystal light or Kool-Aid or a protein shake, there we're looking more at a liquid like water. So in our picture, we can see somebody is mixing up a powdery drink. Which of these do you think is the solute, and which do you think is the solvent? Good, let's go ahead and label them. Over here, we've got the powder that we're going to put in our drink. So that's going to be our solute. And over here, we've got the liquid doing the dissolving. So that's going to be the solvent. Take a minute and explain to your neighbor, please, the difference between solute and solvent. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and flip your notes real quick. We're going to be looking at two broad categories of cellular transport, and these can be described as passive and as active. So just at first glance, which of these do you think requires energy? Good. Active transport is going to require energy, and we're actually not going to deal with active transport until next class. Passive transport does not require energy, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. But first, let's do a quick little review. Here we go. First question. Which part of the cell regulates what goes in and out? Good, the cell membrane, or we can also call it the plasma membrane. Excellent. Next up, what are the two main components of the cell membrane? What are the two main things that the membrane is made of? Nice, lipids and proteins, very good. And finally, what are the two main types of transport? Good, we just mentioned these, and these are passive and active. Fantastic. So we're going to start with this broad category of passive transport. And our definition is that this is going to be movement with the concentration gradient, meaning that substances are going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this just means if you have a bunch of particles and they're all cooped up, for example, if we put a drop of food coloring into a beaker, those droplets start all cooped up, but their natural tendency is to flow from high too low. Now, as these things just naturally spread out, this is a passive process, meaning that it does not require energy. Within this broad heading of passive transport, we're going to see three smaller examples. The first main type of passive transport is called diffusion. And this is looking at the movement of solute particles. Again, this is passive, so these solute particles are moving from high to low, just going with the flow. 
And if we think about it in the context of this diagram, we're going to see the membrane dividing this up. We're also going to see these circles representing the solute particles. And the question is then, which direction will they move? Will they go from left to right or from right to left? Well, we can look at this in terms of concentration and we see that there are more circles over here. So we can actually label this side as the area of high concentration, whereas the side over here is the area of lower concentration. And we said diffusion is movement from high to low, go with the flow. So we'll say that those solute particles will move from high to low, or in this case, from left to right. Our next main type of passive transport is called facilitated diffusion. And this is still the movement of solutes. But this time, the solutes don't move simply through the phospholipids. Instead, they're going to borrow the help of those protein channels. Remember we said the proteins were going to help with movement of substances? So these protein channels are going to act as a bridge or a gateway through the membrane. But it is still substances moving from high to low. It's still going with the flow, which is why facilitated diffusion is still an example of passive transport. Now if we check out this picture, we've got the cell membrane dividing the two sides. And this time we've got this helper channel protein or protein channel. Now we need to figure out the direction of flow. Again, we know it's high to low, so let's pick the side that has more of these solute particles. Good. High here, low here, high to low, go with the flow. Let's draw that arrow showing the direction of those solute particles. Our final example of passive transport is what we call osmosis. And our other two, we were looking at movement of solute. But in osmosis, this time we're looking at movement of the solvent. Osmosis is specifically the movement of water through the membrane. And it's moving from areas of high water concentration to areas of low water concentration. Another way we can say this is that water moves to where the solute is at. So if we look at it in this diagram, we've got the membrane pictured as that divider. We've still got the solute particles shown as the little circles. And this time the water is just going to be assumed to be all the stuff in the background. Now water is higher over here. There's more water over here and there's less water over here. But we can also look at that as water moving towards where all the solute is. Notice that after time the water level has gone up on the right hand side because water rushed over there to try to disperse some of those solute molecules. It's trying to get over there to balance out the concentration on the two sides. We'll look a little bit more at osmosis in a couple of minutes, but first let's think about why any of this would even matter. When we think about why cell transport is so important, it's actually going to help the cells and overall the body maintain a balance, maintain what we call homeostasis. And what that's really saying is if there's too much of something in the cell, we should kick it out. And if we need more of something, we should bring it in. And that's why our cells care so much about substances passing through the membrane, to make sure we get what we need and we kick out any extra waste. It's all about that ideal internal balance. Go ahead and look over this page, summarize with your neighbor the three main types of passive transport, and we'll move on to the rest in just a minute.